All right. Well, first of all, uh, thank you to all for joining. Uh, thank you to Ali for uh, setting this up and continuing to build uh, the community that uh, we're all very excited to be part of. Um, so uh, it's been an interesting uh, first half of the year. Uh, I think that's the understatement of the year as well. Um, and I've got two people who will be able to uh, talk us through both the environment and how they're viewing it. Um, so before I ask you for introductions, let me set the scene just a little bit. Um, whether it's Bloomberg, Reuters, or anybody else, the last couple of years, especially the last year, I would say, they've kind of reported this doom and gloom, the craziness of this market. You probably eat this for lunch, uh, both of you, because uh, you've, you've been operating in regions where, with all due respect, it's kind of been both turbulent from one perspective, but also, handily speaking, it's a different market. So uh, let's just start with some uh, level setting. Just introduce yourselves just a, a little bit, and then we'll we'll dive in some with some questions. But the first question is really about uh, the last few years. This is a time for you to either vent or share, project uh, or opine. What take the choice that you wish. So, Shane, uh, over to you first, and then Arthur. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for having us. Uh, always such an honor and pleasure to be part of this group. And uh, I know how amazing uh, the the community here works. Uh, so super super excited for this uh, panel with Atif and Yusuf. So uh, as Yusuf mentioned, I think the last uh, let's say two years or a year and ten months or so, it has been uh, volatile and extremely uh, dynamic. Like I prefer the word dynamic because at least in the Middle East, we're still. But so many things in my view are happening and, and both good and uh, let's say uh, challenging. And uh, with so much of fundamental growth happening in the Middle East, uh, which I hope to go really deep about, especially on early stage, especially on Pakistan, UAE, Saudi, Egypt, just a lot of things to, to talk about if you really want to uh, go deep on each country in Shuruk. As we invest in across the whole region, we do have a different perspectives on different sectors and different countries. So uh, I'd love to really go, go deep. But uh, personally, I would always uh, say, regardless to the volatility, I think we're still in a good shape. And I truly believe, including uh, Pakistan, which is one of the largest, in my humble view, the markets today, and it will be larger market going forward. Uh, yes, it's not easy, and that's why we're here to discuss and openly share our perspective. But as long as we put our heads down and continue to focus on execution, believe in the long-term potential, at the end, this should all be noise if we do our jobs right. So like, uh, but it's not so easy, uh, of course, but let's uh, really, really excited to continue to uh, meet the founders and support and be part of uh, our ecosystem in Pakistan and beyond. Uh, Adif? Um, thanks, Yusuf, Shane, uh, everybody who's joined. Um, excited to be here. So I am the founder of Indus Valley Capital. Uh, we've been investing, it's a Pakistan-focused fund, and we've been investing for a little over three years. So we saw the last part of an incredible bull run uh, for global public markets, as well as venture capital, and then we are seeing this downturn as well. Um, and what I would say is our view and we will talk more about you know, the challenges, but the meta point I wanna make is that our long-term view actually through that bull market and now this uh, downturn has not changed. And then that's very important to um, you know, recognize and internalize that startups and VCs, they are a very long-term game. So you're looking at you know, like seven to 10 years for a startup, but for a VC firm, actually it's longer because each fund's life cycle is 10 years. But if you're doing multiple funds, really you are in it for 15 to 20 years. And um, later, you know, I'd love to go into some of the exponential trends that you know, like are still on track despite this volatility that make me very optimistic and bullish um, long run. Obviously we have had our challenges and uh, this year, and particularly Pakistan, you know, uh, last year has been very challenging both economically, we had a very high inflation, uh, and that's impacting people's lives. That's impacting employee morale, founder morale. Uh, we've also had political turbulence. Um, and um, uh, on both of those, I think when you are investing in emerging markets or building for emerging markets, that's the norm. It's not an exception. Yeah. So that will happen. It will happen for different countries at different times. 
Um, so you have to take it with stride and basically differentiate between short term and long term. And in the short term, do everything you need to de-risk the business. Uh, but in the long term, stay optimistic and stay on track about the opportunity. So let's uh, let's dive in. So first of all, uh, congrats uh, on the recent fundraise, uh, Shane, um, and also Adif. I will say right up front. I mean, you were at this very very early uh, before it was a thing. Um, I remember uh, emailing you in Fund One uh, when it was just basically being announced, and, and you're raising. Uh, and I think your office was at a table in Zareen's in the in the Bay Area at the time, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, we didn't uh, share any uh, halwa together, but uh, I look forward to doing that uh, in London, hopefully later this year. Um, so maybe talk a little bit. Look, there are founders on this call uh, who are either raising, thinking of raising, building a business or otherwise, or thinking about their subsequent raise. And one of the things that most uh, founders don't realize is actually each of us as VCs have to do this ourselves. So there's probably more empathy and uh, things in common we have with founders than they than they realize. So let's actually just talk about that because you're talking to investors to invest in a strategy in a region which we're all well aware is will have turbulence and will have you know a dynamic nature uh, on a which, which will be pretty regular. And so you've got to be able to tell your story and bring people in to be there. And the same thing applies for a lot of these founders. So let me pose the first question um, to, to, to both of you. When you think about fundraising, how, do, how have you been able to speak about the markets um, and the opportunity in a way that the founders also need to have in their pitch, which they're not giving to you? right now and what you're hearing from some of the stories. So kind of a two-ended question, but I wanted to make sure I jo join the dots. Um, Artif, do you want to go first and then Shane, you next? Sure. Um, so first of all, thanks for mentioning that. It's really, really hard to fundraise as a VC, as you know. Um, and, uh, you know, the no sting a bit more because it's not an idea being rejected. It's basically you saying, look, I can do this. And somebody saying, no, sorry, I don't think, I don't agree with you. Uh, but that's part of the game. Um, so look, what's worked really well is um, that, you know, like talking about that long term. Um, and these days, you know, you get a bit more questions about the current macro challenges and what I tell potential investors and what I tell founders and uh, even prospective employees who are thinking about joining the startups is the same thing. And that is Pakistan is in the very first innings of startups in BC. So it's one of the few large countries that's still yet to go online, you know, like it's happened in all the other larger countries. Um, and the consequence of that is um, that it's the opportunity for startups in BC is not as much a function of how the macro economy grows, whether it grows at 6% CAGR or four or three, honestly, it does not matter. You can do the math over a 10 year period. It's, it's not even a two X Delta, right? Uh, what it is a function of is the economy going from offline to online. So when you have a close to $400 billion economy, that is maybe now two to 3% online. Over a 10 year period, it goes to 15 to 20% online. You do the math on that, right? So that's very sim simple. You can plug in your assumptions. And then you apply a very conservative enterprise value multiple over that, right? So we, one thing we've learned through this market is that multiples can get really crazy. So let's stay conservative. So if you take that 15 to 20% of an economy that maybe grows slowly and just becomes $500 billion, you're still looking at 75 to $100 billion in online spending on an annual basis. Now, mm -hmm. if you give it, you know, let's say a 1X multiple, because most of it is going to be GMB. Even then, you are going to be creating 75 to $100 billion in enterprise val valuation, right? Um, uh, let's give it half X multiple. So you can plug in your own assumptions. I literally tell investors this, plug in your own numbers and any way you slice it, you're gonna get a number that's large enough where it makes sense to be investing in early stage in Pakistan. And I found that that this resonates very well. And all of a sudden, like what's happening today that goes a bit into the background. Now on the practical side of things, you do have to answer the question of, look, if you are the first believer writing that first million dollar check in a startup, that million is not going to be enough to build to that large enterprise value that these startups really, really are going for. 
So where does the fall on capital come from? And I think like that's a more challenging question today to answer. Uh, and then the way I think about it is if you build a good company, you know, there are, the capital is always gonna flow. Uh, a lot of the time the challenge is, you know, as you are starting, you're figuring out this business model. Uh, so you're running a lot of experiments, but if you're past that point and there are good economics in the long run, then that capital is there. You might have to work harder in this environment to go get it. Maybe it will take, you know, 50 conversations instead of 15, uh, but it's there. And that's the risk we are taking. And we're comfortable taking that risk. And that's uh, great founders are also comfortable taking that risk and they go knowingly into that. So you have an open conversation about that and bring the focus really on the long-term opportunity. And that's worked uh, well for us. And we believe the same approach uh, also works well for founders. Fantastic. Shane, so you've uh, congrats on the uh, most recent fund. Please tell us, uh, give, give more insight for that. I'd like you to give a, uh, a plug-in for that. And then second, you know, you've had to raise across a very interesting region. Um, and, you know, I would like to say founders and innovation is global. And so the problems are very much the same, uh, both the problems of building a company, raising a, a fund, whether it's already or just fundraising in general. Um, insights that you would basically have, I mean, would definitively that you see, and I'll go back to the question is like, your founders who are raising, you yourself have raised, and there's a miss in that. I'll give you one data point. On average, between, uh, so we just uh, did our fundraise, uh, so Ridge Ventures raised Fund 5, um, it's a $180 million fund. Um, I did some I did some uh, some math on this. It's between 50 and 80 different touch points with the potential LP from when you first have that conversation. Now, I'm not expecting the same to happen with, with venture fundraising for founders, but that's literally the effort it took to start from start to finish, so yeah. So uh, thank you. Uh, let me classify two different uh, answers. First, how we fundraise, how we view fundraising and how, I think how they will apply to the founders. And second, a bit more specifically on why and what, how the founders in my view should pitch now, which is slightly different from the VC. So first on uh, commonalities between VC fundraising and the founders. First, uh, uh, I think it's important to always highlight VC's fundraising also is very difficult. I wouldn't say there is a, is this more difficult or less difficult. Everyone has a different style, but all I can say is also extremely humbling journey for, for everyone. <laughs> Normally the way I would say it should we're founders partners, not only because we truly believe working with the founders, but also because we know how difficult it is to be a founder. Like, uh, Shurok business model, actually, it just happens to be we invest in other companies, but we're also a startup. Uh, and uh, we actually, it sucks because we see our revenue really in year seven, year eight, whereas you can actually see your revenue perhaps the next week. So there's a lot of uh, uh, stuff and we also have to just raise on a pitch deck. But at the end, I think what I can really come back to as the emphasis on fundraising is if you're really hustling and actually are uh, persistent to share how you're different and what your thesis is. And uh, what I really want to highlight is you got to be extremely thoughtful on what you really want to build at your firm. As a startup, I think sometimes where it's easy to be carried away, I want to do this because this companies in the US or Asia were popular. I think I can, I have a little bit of a family background or network or a college background. Let me kind of do that. Uh, I, I think I really want to ask uh, how many of us really spend months to think about what's really uh, the, the value prop you think you can build versus uh, 10 others. This really applies to the VCs also. Like at the end, many people will say I'm early stage. Like what does it mean like early stage for pre-seed, seed, pre-A series A, some people will say, I have this in Saudi, this in UAE, I this FinTech, but I think some people say everything is FinTech. Like we really need to be thoughtful on how we are different, how I can dominate that space. And I would dare use the word, we got to really win in that market. And what, that's how AOPs will give us the capital and how VCs will give the founders the capital. So being thoughtful, uh, and I am really sorry to say it's such a generic word, but I think that is something in my view uh, all of us sometimes would need to do a bit more. Now for the for the founders, 
I think about three to four months ago in the similar event in, in the UAE, I mentioned that for Pakistan founders at the moment, there are a few things probably if you can articulate uh, the following points well, it's easier for you to fundraise. First, uh, a lot of international investors have a view that uh, Pakistan as a country and the ecosystem the next three years minimum, if not five years or so, is going to be tumultuous to journey. So, and we're okay because we're in the long term, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't have any plans on how you're going to mitigate the potential fundraising risk type of thing. So if you can really articulate how I'm going to be build a defensive unit economics, recurring revenue, repeat customer dynamics that will drive to profitability. Again, being able to articulate on these, even if you're a precedent C, even if you're wrong, is very different from not being able to articulate at all. And I think this is really, really, really critical where I think sometimes we're too excited about top down, but it's also important to, to talk about that. Second, I also give a feedback or just my consideration that uh, if you can show that the, you are you, either you can build such a massive business in Pakistan, again, as a profitable only, or you can also do cross border, cross revenue, dollar based revenue, it's even more positive because we know that the, that then you can actually use the current situation as your strength. Dollar based revenue while keeping your costs low in local currencies, that's the actually huge strength, right? We know that the frankly GCC cost is not cheap. Constantly going up, and it's actually going up in an accelerated pace. So if you can address and show that my model, I can compete and do well compared to all these different countries while keeping my costs low, I think that becomes a huge strength in the current market. So those are two de detailed but generic answers. And if you have more questions, also happy to yeah. address that. So what what I think is kind of important, especially in in this environment. If you if you just think about some of the difficulties. So I'll, I'll give you the context from at least um, a lot of the Silicon Valley companies. And we see companies in, in the US, but we also invest outside. Um, it's been very clear that like post SVB, that you see uh, some of the messaging in terms of what companies are talking about um, in terms of both cash management or burn, that they would never have talked about before in a previous pitch. Uh, same thing happened during pandemic, where it was like, we're a fully remote team before there was remote team, right? So there's a little bit of an attachment. A lot of founders are going to be thinking about fundraising and, uh, you know, really being able to tweak their pitch to be able to make sure it's more relevant and not tone deaf in terms of market conditions. What are say one of the two things that they really need to emphasize much more on when they're talking to people in, in, in our shoes. Arjit, do you want to go first? Yeah, so look, it's important to understand what the investor expectations are and uh, building on the earlier point about uh, that follow on capital risk and how much capital do you need to get towards being in a stage uh, where you don't have a strict dependency on that capital. Um, and that comes into that comes by going into the details of um, your business and understanding what the levers are that you can use. Uh, now you have to be careful here, where if you just stop, you know, like if you just start responding to what the investors want to hear and say, "Look, we just want to build a profitable company," and you are at seed stage in your first year, sure you can. But then I'm also looking for, look, is this a big business? And, yes. and I feel like I'm seeing some founders make that basic mistake and saying, look, we don't care about, you know, like scale and growth at all costs. We just want to build like this profitable business and that doesn't work either. So it's a balance. And I feel you have to start, at least for us, start with showing that large opportunity and then saying, look, I understand it will require across multiple stages, this amount of capital. So one path, if I can, in the sunny day scenario, we keep doing well, we keep convincing follow-on investors and are able to raise capital. You're going for category leadership in, in this, right? I, I love hearing that. I think there are other investors who love hearing that. And, but we we will raise when we don't need to raise. That's, that's very important in this market because you don't have margin of error. The rounds are taking much longer. Uh, you know, even six months is not enough anymore. So you have to plan, you know, like 12 months. 
And the founders who show that maturity and show that flexibility that look, we are able to build scale, keeping economics in mind and try to raise off of that. And if, you know, and the markets are dynamic things, so they will be evolving. So the market that was six months ago from today, it looks different. It will be different again in six months. So having that flexibility to say, look, we'll try to raise off these certain milestones. And then based on what we are hitting back from the market, we always have this path. Right. Uh, and we're going to modulate our growth and we're going to have, you know, like six month focus on, on profitability. So you want to hear both of that. And I think founders tend to be in one extreme or the other. And in this market, you have to show that you can uh, do both. One thing we are seeing is investors are, and, and this is something I feel VC as a whole can do better. They are looking for perfection. And so sometimes what you see is um, there is a perfectly good business, uh, you know, large market, they're doing well, they have the metrics. And just on one or two of these points, like VCs are basically, you know, saying no. And VCs also have to understand that you have to underwrite some risk. If you're looking for perfection, that opportunity should not exist, right? You have to like, what is the yes. risk? Well, I'm that not sure why you're in the business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I think we have had this conversation with the potential co-investors as well. Like when we get, get involved, they're doing a diligence call and we're like, look, this business has answered these three questions. These two questions, they plan to answer in the next 18 months. If you're comfortable with that risk, you have to come on board. And I feel the best founders can have that conversation as well. So it has to be more nuanced. Um, it's just not just as simple as the path to profitability in my mind. Jane, you've seen no shortage of pitches from across the region. Um, calibrating that with your new fund, there's an emphasis that you look back and you say, I really wish they said more of this or what would that be? Is it to me? Yeah, that's you, Shane. So, look, every business is so different. And I, know, I, know. Is- I get it. You're going to get diversity and then some. I get that. But just... <laughs> You know. okay, there are sometimes what I want to hear more, and this is very uh, uh, technical, is sometimes I, I want to hear more that the founders actually have an accurate understanding of their own revenue model and the cash flow, how it actually is going to play out. I, right. I think many founders are very good at, and I'm talking about amazing founders, which I know a lot of them are here in this uh, community. They probably are very, very good at talking about the business, talking about competitors, talking about the market. If you are not there, you need to do a lot of homework before you even, I think, talking to the VCs. But what I really think uh, for all of us to be a bit better as a, as a next steps is, is it shows when you have a such a detailed understanding of your cash flow, the working capital requirement, the regulatory landscape, like uh, let's go deeper than just uh, level one or layer one. If you are talking about a lot of cash-based economy or cash-based uh, businesses, you really need to demonstrate you know how much cash in and cash out. But many, many founders, they say, oh, I'm not a CFO. Or they say, oh, I, I don't have a banking experience like you. I, I understand that, but I think you're gonna be managing the, the cash flow, right? And I think a lot of the issues like I can give an example, sometimes we only look at the balance sheet view or the income statement, but we don't look at a weekly cash balance, how it changes. That actually can kill the business. That's mm-hmm. only one of the pure fintech. Let's, I think a lot of the best fintech founders that we have seen, that we have back, really demonstrate how the regulatory landscape is changing and what is their thesis and how can we influence or not influence, but why do I think I can win? So those type of a technical answer, I think make it A plus and convert sophisticated investors to invest in you versus, look, I think perhaps you're too early. And I hate to say that as a seed stage, early stage, because about 45% of our first checks are pre-revenue. Yes. Right? We actually are experts on backing pre-revenue, but sometimes I even, I tell them, look, you're too early. Too early. Say, what do you mean, what yeah. do you mean too early? You just backed another company yeah. a million and a half earlier. But I say, look, this is why, but here, at least I feel you are not, you have not really thought through hard enough about how you're going to build the business with the capital we give. I think for me, it's that type of a, a, a detailed discussion. Sometimes so I want to go deeper. 
Right. Okay. So uh, a couple of questions that are coming up. And we'll try and keep the rest next second half of this kind of more conversational. Um, question really comes down to, look, you know, the, this um, notion of the, the pre-seed uh, funding round evolved over the last few years, you know, um, and you would have a lot of funds which only focused on this. They want to get a specific ownership side. They can write a specific level of check. They don't have to worry about following. They're okay with dilution going forward. Um, but that was part of an ecosystem in Silicon Valley, which has maturity in things like angel investing and friends and family rounds. I mean, it's literally called a friends and family round years ago. Most people actually forget that. Uh, it was actually, when you have different rounds, that was a fam friends and family round. And then you had uh, seed and others. So if you think about the markets that we're in, th these ecosystems still need to mature from this standpoint. So what type of funding when should they have either secured perhaps before they talk to you? So this part of it, um, I, I want to be very specific about this question. It's really about the stage that you invest in. Now, because the common refrain, Shane, you mentioned is you're too early, right? Uh, and but there's a lot of factors that go into that. You're seeing hundreds of companies a year, and you can't be, you know, providing 50 minutes of feedback for each one. You may be too early in the product, and this is a message to family. You may be too early in terms of your team formation. You may be too early from a revenue standpoint. It, it, could, it could vary, but generally the, the notion is too early. So if we think about too early from a funding standpoint, how should founders think about, you know, uh, there's a two-part question. How should founders think about being able to put in their own capital, being able to provide work with angels, that ecosystem still needs to be developed? And then the second part is, how does that ecosystem, how can that ecosystem be developed in general, such that, that we do have more funding sources and more encouragement uh, from that standpoint? Um, either one of you can, can go towards that, because it's always the first issue about the fund rate. So it's like that first check, uh, and sometimes it's from your own bank account, uh, but then it's you're asking others. Just would love to get your viewpoint on that. Happy to go, uh, Atif. So uh, it's a very uh, sensitive and, and, in my view, difficult question, actually, because uh, uh, here is uh, my, Shane's uh, view. And I think some of, some of the founders uh, know me very well and uh, how passionate and crazy I am. Uh, what I absolutely think is a must is the founders are full time. So I'll give uh, one by one. So for me, capital invested. Uh, I do think that's a very fair uh, request, especially for many founders. If you have to, I mean, you, you got to believe in yourself. Like, sure, we also believed in ourselves, especially if you are new to the, the game, right? But uh, not everyone comes with uh, like a capital they can put. And also sometimes you actually are in a natural position to get friends and families or angels. So sure, we don't differentiate from how much have you put or not. I do, for, for very clear emphasis, we do, ex, we do uh, really show sincere respect if the founders have invested capital to their business, especially if that is a lot of money. Yeah. We really respect that. We take that into consideration for the valuation. We take that into consideration for our preference to lead and put the size of it because that shows me you're, you have a strong conviction. However, what is more important is that the founders are absolutely full-time. Uh, I think sometimes founders have this uh, view that, oh, I have this uh, pushy job. Or oh, if you give me the capital, let me be full-time because I can do X, Y, Z. Uh, it, it could work. We're just not the right party. Shurok is not the right party for, for that uh, opportunity. Happy to set out on those. And I don't believe that's the right governance, nor the right expectation, nor the right friendship and a partnership we want to have. So it's just the who we are. We have uh, uh, we we have not made that mistake, in my view, and mm -hmm. we don't uh, uh, we don't. That's not the pre-seed situation we get in. But for the capital, as I mentioned, we respect people who have put it, but it's not essential. Essential, I think, it's more of the time and the showing the conviction in other forms. Right. Uh, I think. Um, so Yusuf, agree with you, the names of the rounds, they've lost, you know, their meaning. Um, so the way we describe it to founders is uh, your first million dollars, we are happy to lead it. 
So we can do all of it in some cases, we can do half of it, like whatever it takes. Um, and we don't really need for you to have uh, raised capital before. If you have, and it's an angel pre-seed 50K, 100K, but you haven't given up more than 10% of the company, that's totally fine. Uh, but you have to be careful, you know, uh, not to give up too much of the company before you even raise the first institutional round, which is where we come in. Um, and completely agree with Shane uh, that it's more about conviction. So if you're waiting and saying, look, one of my co-founder will only leave my job if we have a million dollars in the bank, that doesn't work. Um, but as long as you have, you know, jumped in, you've built a prototype, you're spending time, you don't necessarily have to have invested your own capital. Um, the reality is that, you know, like often founders do need to, uh, if even to just, you know, like cover their living expenses. So there's an opportunity cost you're paying. And I think like when it comes to Pakistan, that's, that's an area where there is a gap. And I've talked about it before. We do not have, uh, pre-seed part of the ecosystem figured out that first 50K to 100K. So a mm -hmm. lot of the angels who are investing, they're also investing in that first institutional round. A lot of smaller funds are also joining in that first million dollar round. And uh, there is a really good opportunity for somebody to actually come and start writing. And that could be angel syndicates, that could be, you know, like small pre-seed funds that come into the market. And we'd love to support uh, that. And we've seen some uh, recent ones, you know, like that we have spoken with and, and are happy to help. Uh, so that's in uh, essentially our model, and we are usually the first believers, first money in, uh, and then we work closely with the founders on the follow-on capital. So uh, depending, we do have like half of our fund is allocated for follow-ons, and our preference is to have some other investor come in and lead the next round, and that diversification of cap table is important for founders as well. So, you know, we are not too greedy about that continuing to, you know, like take ownership in good companies. We're happy to have somebody else come in. Uh, and building these partnerships across successive rounds, that's very, very important. You bring new capabilities, new networks. Um, but uh, where it makes sense and where it's needed, we are happy to co-lead that next round as well. So we did that for Bazaar, where we led the pre-seed round. Uh, and then we co-led the seed and we have recently done that with Maksat as well. And we're pretty flexible on that. Um, well, let me jump into a question about how you work. Uh, every uh, every VC fund adds different sort of value. Um, some will be more involved, some less. That's totally fine. No judgment. Um, how do you work uh, with your uh, with your portfolio companies? Shane, you want to go first? Yes. Uh, uh, so we normally bifurcate the uh, six functions of a portfolio management to support our founders. First is the talent recruitment. Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of time helping recruit, uh, uh, especially for the, the right roles, uh, because many, many now people from the US or Asia are actually migrating to Pakistan and we do get reached out. So normally we take a first call and then refer to our founders. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, we call it Country expansion is a very big part of a Shuroka playbook. So when we invest, because we do have a seven offices now in six countries, the last one in Korea. So we also start to cover Asia. Like if we invest in Pakistan, we want to help them expand to UAE, Saudi, and others if they are interested. So right. that is something we have a very active discussion. Third, we call customer intro. It's just very, very important part of our job. Like Atif and I, we work very closely with our companies that I know. Like we just build a lot of a network through our LPs, potential clients for our uh, startup. So sometimes we cannot help too much in B2C, but B2B definitely we can add uh, a lot. Fourth is I call partnership intro. So if you need a other providers, other partners who can resell, who can actually just add support, we also try to really facilitate that. Fifth, uh, we also say a Marcom or like a, some kind of a branding support. Because what we have found, the founder should look likes to back. They might be extremely amazing in operations. Sometimes they don't know really on Markham and I suck at it. I also don't really know how to do a good job. So we spend uh, uh, time on that. Six, uh, but not least, the uh, business strategy and fundraising strategy. That's, uh, although it's, it seems so basic, because the Shuruk, we see 3,000 companies a year. We kind of understand what works, what doesn't work. Now we have 65 portfolio companies. We have seen it. We have done it. Like, I will tell you, don't do this in uh, recruiting this type of profile. Like, don't do this. Don't expand to X, Y, Z. 
Like, uh, so those type of business strategy, but also very importantly, fundraising strategy. We learned that this is where also Atif uh, has uh, tons of value. We know that uh, founders sometimes are not experts on fundraising strategy. Mm -hmm. And we learned that in a hard way. So let's work hand to hand. Well, Atif used the word like a follow on rounds, but also what is the right geodynamics? What's the right narrative and positioning? And who do we need to talk to? Yep. Right, we know our fellow investor friends the best, and really the founders. I think they sometimes underestimate how much investors talking to each other, how how uh, uh, powerful that is. Because we need to be your brand ambassador. Yeah, right? we really need to be a brand ambassador. We need to be pitching for you without pitching in conferences, in t-shirts, in dinners, and etc. And we try to do that as as often as possible. That's why it's important to have a relationship with uh, your lead investors and extremely closely share as much as possible so that they know what to say. They know how to be uh, your, your value at partner. Okay. So that's the, those are the six functions. Got it. Okay, so I did just quick for a few. Let's just talk about diligence um, at this stage. You know, how much diligence do you do? You know, where do you focus more areas versus not? I mean, would you look at Companies' financial statements, if they've got revenue traction, I think that's an obvious one. If they don't, then they clearly don't. They just have to come up with a revenue model. But can you just maybe some insight in terms of diligence uh, very briefly? Sure. Um, so we do look at companies, you know, sometimes that have revenue are at a later stage. And in that case, of course, you look at financial statements. But uh, more often than not, um, you know, this is a company that's pre-stage, maybe they've been around, you know, like a couple months, a couple of weeks in some cases. Um, so there is not much uh, traction data, forget financial statements to look at. Um, so the number one most important thing for us is understanding the market opportunity. Um, and sometimes we'll have a thesis on that because, you know, there are certain theses that we understand. And this is an advantage, especially for Pakistan because of a late start. Things have happened in India, Indonesia, Egypt. So we can learn from that. So we have some view on that. We want to understand founders thinking about that. And we're looking in particular for a unique insight because again, as VCs, in any given area, we're probably talking to several founders and you're comparing them. And the founders that have a unique insight tend to do better and win. So that's very, very important. And then we go into a market sizing exercise with the founders uh, to further calibrate and seeing how big can this be? So that's that's right. number one. Uh, and then it comes down to, you know, founder quality. Right. Uh, and that's somewhat subjective, but we spend time with them uh, through questions, you know, uh, through meetings, through written questions, and try to get a sense of, you know, how they think, what the founder dynamic is, are they really, really you know, like committed to this idea? Will they go the whole mile? Um, so as early stage investors, those things are much more important for us uh, than financial statements because those um, are not there. Payne, you're investing in in a very different set of countries. Uh, just give us a little bit of insight in terms of some of the diligence process that you would go through. Yes. Uh, so like Atif, uh, we collaborate and compete uh, a lot. So we we love pre-seed and seed stage. So many because of our fund size of 160 million, I think people think we're generally Series A. We're really a seed stage focused mm. fund. We are happy to lead and uh, series A tickets, but uh, we really, our our DNA is a precedency, meaning that pre-revenue companies or very small revenue is what we what we prefer. Now, how do we do uh, the deep dive or the due diligence? At the end, uh, I'll start with the founders. We try to ask uh, two questions. This is more like uh, just uh, Shane's uh, speaking first. Can I work for this founder? Is a very important question for me. Like, uh, I think all of us work extremely hard and passionate and I hope we're smart enough. If I believe that this founder is really the expert in this domain that I can work uh, for this uh, 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 this founder, I think that's a huge uh, litmus test, at least for me personally. And second, what I also care a lot about is, can this founders run a $500 million company? Mm. Not every founder uh, will be able to and doesn't have to uh, manage a $500 million company. You can be great cash flow positive, 50 million, 100 million, or you can be a great founder who actually pass on to another set of uh, serial entrepreneurs, but at least show up at the pre-seed and because this is a long-term partnership and I'm going to be speaking to them a lot. 
right? Both good and bad times. Uh, I need to have a conviction that these people have a $500 million company and the relationship will be that uh, good and bad, but it's at the end very direct and transparent so that we can hold each other as really a partner. And trust me, we'll always be your brand ambassador to outside. And right. we're gonna do everything we can. Being the cheerleader, I wanna be the cheerleader for the founders we back and these two are very important. But like, uh, uh, if I were to just quickly talk about the, the, the due, diligence, due diligence on the business side, uh, I don't want to go through all the typical answers like a large market, et cetera. But again, I really think you need to be thoughtful on what is the revenue you think you can generate. Right. Like uh, not every, not, it's not easy to just say, I'm going to take 15%, 10%, 5%, 2% on different business models, e-commerce, 20% plus platform, 10% plus fintech, one to 4% is not that simple sometimes right. or many times. You really need to think about what's the value we bring. And that discussion, if you can convince that the, your solution, what you're going to build actually will deliver that, genu- that, that revenue, uh, generally we're extremely excited to back you and to be part of your journey. Okay. Um, I guess a couple of final questions that I sort of wanted to pose and have been sort of coming in. Um, one is just how people reach you. I, I think this is just a common piece. I, I, I have a very different answer to this. I wouldn't go down this th- this road, but, you know, that's, we'd love to just hear, like, what is the best way? Um, it sounds a fundamental question, but it's always asked at every single one of these. I will happily give Atif's number if someone asks me Atif's number. <laughs> like, uh, now, good. I Can I get it? Because I don't have it still. I'm just kidding. No, go, go ahead. That's I think for, and I, I, for, for, I can speak for Atif, but also every uh, uh, local VC friend that I have in Pakistan, I actually believe, uh, Yusuf, VC as a group, particularly our friends in uh, Pakistan ecosystem, are very accessible. Yes. Like, I actually think it's, it's a small litmus test. If you don't know how to get a warm referral to talk to the uh, VC, either through LP or founder or other friend and et cetera, like VCs, we can ask, how are we gonna get to the other people you wanna get to? All of us had to build somewhere from scratch, right? And VCs generally, like we're in these conferences, panels, like many of those uh, events, we, like you can go through our website, which founders we have back, Karim on network to, to many other network. They are there. They're the founders. We have back there our good friends. And the, I have to say, Shuruk, I do prioritize if it's a room referral from the people that I am. Because again, we do see so many companies. And like we only invest in about 14 to 16 companies a year out of mm-hmm. thousands that we see. Like I prioritize if our friends from like a you know, retailer to collapse with Digicart, the deal card, all this like our friends that refer to us, then we prioritize because they know our style. They yes. know how to approach us. And I hate to say this, but unfortunately that's the truth. That's why I do recommend you do need to get through us normally through the warm first of best. Although our website is all available. Yes. Are they- um, so you can submit a pitch on our website. We you know, have a regular process. We look through that. Um, but I would, um, you know, concur with Shane that if you can find a referral, um, you'll get better, faster responses. I think what doesn't work as well is, you know, and my number is probably, you know, with everyone here, but a WhatsApp message or socials, they just don't have the right tool. So even yeah. if you are going to send a cold email, uh, a cold message, send an email because for more, most VCs, that's their to-do yeah. list as well. And mm-hmm. they have a workflow associated with that. Um, but yeah, reach uh, to the website. Here's, here's, here's one thing I would say to every founder when this is part of this is, you know, subconsciously a bit of a test, right? I mean, if you just think about building a company and hustle and kind of the grit, the, literally the, the shoe leather business that we're basically in and reaching out, like it, the, I, I have to apply the same thing from a VC perspective. There's, a, there's hundreds of LPs I don't know. Right, they just we just don't know them, but we know they invest in venture, and we've got to figure out a path to get to them. And that may well be unless so. This parallels still apply. It may well be at the right conference. You're having basically having a conversation. Sometimes it's persistence. 
And sometimes it is, you know, triangulation of effort through multiple people in some way, shape. Some people are open to cold outreach, some people are not, and that's totally fine. But part of this is, I think just as a message to founders, that that literally requires a, a part of the test. Like if you're able to be able to reach and do that and articulate it well, I actually think that's, that's required, right? Like the answer, I mean, the thing, this reason I basically mentioned, the reason I wanted basically to be clear is we get asked this all the time. And I, I, think, I think it's important now, especially in this environment to say, part of this is just to demonstrate how you are persistent, how you are able to listen, how you are able to articulate your message you know, do it on an email or otherwise and be able to uh, and be able to navigate a path. We have to do the same. Exactly. Just to say that, like, uh, we have to do the same. Like, we never really quote email to our LP prospect. Even if we might do, they're not going to respond. Right? So you're not alone. And it's not easy. Of course, it's difficult. But I think fundraising or asking for capital is difficult, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we're asking, we're talking about millions of dollars. Like that's a that's a significant responsibility and, and ask. Yeah. yeah. So here's the here's a other question. Maybe just to uh, give some more insight. Give a volume of companies that you saw last year or this year, and you, you know. So Shane, you already said you invested in maybe ten to fifteen companies a year, etc. Yeah. What what is the conversion? I mean, the same thing applies. Like the parallels. Uh, both when it comes to fundraising, whether it's, you know, if you're an e-commerce business, you know, demand generation, et cetera, conversion, opening of emails, it's the same thing. So you probably see several hundred companies a year. Is that, is that a fair, fair estimate? So we did the math. Uh, the numbers are like crazy because if you look at every web, everything that comes through our website, because the Shuruk, we're also very active investor in blockchain and gaming. Yeah. Like some of you know, that means globally, a lot of companies, we actually see 3,000, but we don't see all 3,000. Sure. We really focus on about 500. Sure. Like the companies we meet and like the talk and et cetera yeah. is about 500. Out of the 500, we invest in about 15 uh, every year. So give or take. Right. Uh, so, so, so yeah. and the, we, we are quite disciplined on that pace. Ever since Shuruk inception, we've always been consistent on that pace. We like that pace because that's the volume. We can really add so much value to our portfolio companies, right? It's our commitment to you as a founder who will receive our strategic uh, investment. And uh, we continue, will continue to do the same. We're, we have always been active, always deploying. Right. There's not a single uh, quarter we don't deploy. So we're always uh, looking. Atif on your side? Uh, yeah, for us, I would say it's about one in 80 to one in 100, um, yeah. so, so similar. And uh, again, we have been consistently investing, you know, since 2020, and we try to keep a consistent pace regardless of whether it's a bull market or a downturn. Mm -hmm. uh, and our last term sheet that we just gave and invested was actually on 9th May for Pakistani founders in the evening, a couple hours after uh, Imran Khan was arrested and shit had hit the fan. Uh, so again, these small, you know, things, what's happening this week doesn't really, really matter. Uh, okay. And we're continuing to actively invest. Okay. Uh, Shane, question uh, for the Any uh, remarkable uh, differences that you see between founders that you've met with in Pakistan to the region that you've been investing in? Uh, uh, so everyone is different, but a few punchlines. First, I actually firmly believe Pakistani entrepreneurs that we were able to see are extremely hustlers. The, the work ethic, like as a Korean, like I think I really resonate. Yeah. People just work extremely hard and I respect that. I think working hard is a great IP. Not, not many people might say it or believe that, but like uh, you just work extremely hard. And you have that hunger. Uh, for me, that's very, very important, right? Second, I think uh, with the likes of uh, uh, Atif in this valley and many other friends in the ecosystem and us, Pakistan, uh, the VC startup ecosystem has been like growing exponentially. Now it's a little bit of a, a challenge, but as long as we maintain our confidence level and, and, and keep the uh, humility and the humbleness, I think uh, we're only gonna increase uh, from here, but sometimes there is that asymmetry, 
misaligned expectations on either the humbleness or the, 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 the terms or actually just the readiness, right? But like uh, I think Pakistan, uh, uh, generally the companies we have uh, invested, we really believe they're extremely mature, one of the most like strongest and the most stable of companies, right? A large vision, they know Pakistan has not been easy. And if they, they believe, if they can overcome this, they can overcome anything. And I totally believe that. Right. I cannot say that's necessarily the truth for other countries, because other countries, perhaps they didn't see the downturn as much. They right. didn't really see the, like, the challenges as much as we saw. It's not that they don't have challenges, but it might be sometimes the severity of the challenges. Um, there's one question, which is, um... How, how do you deal with the failures? Like, you know, uh, one thing I just want to make clear, this is not just Europe, Pakistan, Middle East, it's the US. The number of failures are grossly underreported in this industry. It's just, just a fact, right? You'll see the headlines of fundraising, but those are headlines of fundraising. It's not headlines of business building, right? There's actually very few IPO uh, headlines that come into place. How have you dealt with failure? in some of your companies? Yeah, I can uh, go first. So, so look, um, you have to go into this business uh, expecting failure. This, that's the expected case. So most, most more startups would fail than make it. And that's true for VC funds as well, you know? Uh, so if you look at VC as an asset class, you know, it's the top quartile, that really, you know, like does well and everybody else basically is either just, you know, uh, spending 10 years and not making any money off of it, right? And your opportunity cost is pretty high. So you have to go in doing that. And what personally helps me and many of the founders that we have worked with is this sense of a mission. You're doing it for a reason. Uh, and I like to think about it with the mindset of if, you know, I, me starting in this Valley Capital, let's say 10 years from now, doesn't work at all. Uh, returns, you barely return the money. Um, would it have still been worth doing? So I asked myself this question three years ago and the answer was yes for me, right? And whenever you find something like that where you wanna do it regardless of the odds of success, actually that's a great thing to you know, like spend your life doing because the ultimate measure of your life is not gonna be you know, like how, how many, hundreds of millions of dollars in value you generated. It's how you spent your time. And I think when you go with that mindset, you will have some failures along the way, but eventually you're going to make it. Uh, and that's what we've seen. You know, uh, When I speak with Airlift's founders and what they're doing now and early employees, and many of them have made to other startups and I hear great things about them. Um, they had a very similar mindset about that and they do not regret for a moment, you know, spending three years building Airlift, they learned so much, um, you know, uh, they built such uh, amazing relationships. Um, so that's, you know, like what keeps me going and that's what we like to see in founders be back as well. Okay, fantastic. Uh, first, uh, I think we should start with, it's really tough for, for everyone, like, uh, and, uh, because this is the, we're speaking with the founders here. I, I actually wanted to always say that founders sometimes think that, oh, investors, you have so much portfolio companies, like uh, uh, it's okay for you to, to have that. I actually really don't agree with that. For us, like I'm sure this is Yusuf, your style, Atif, your style, and I, I can really speak for the friends here. Uh, everything uh, counts. It doesn't matter if I put small amount, this amount, or whether how, like at least for us to show up, we're extremely personal on that. And I, I openly uh, admit it. And I take it extremely personally and seriously. Uh, and we do, we, we at least commit to we'll do everything we can to, to, to make it happen. Now, unfortunately, uh, it sometimes does not work. Right, and uh, what we as Shuruk try to do is when we invest, we have something called KCA, key critical assumption. This is before we invest. This is where we spend 80% of our due diligence on. Like, uh, because this has to be true for us to invest in. Sometimes that is about business, sometimes it's about market, regulation, founders, 
many, many, uh, could be many things. When we look at the data of the companies who have uh, uh, made, I wouldn't say mistakes, but like uh, that didn't work out. It is less about, it has less been about the business uh, model. We knew exactly what risk we were uh, underwriting and uh, uh, perhaps uh, it didn't turn out at the right time, but business, I think, should have, we're quite confident we're good at assessing it. Where sometimes we are thrown off is this a founder dynamics or something like uh, do, do things to change at the, like the unit economics and et cetera with competitive forces, external forces, also fundraising risk. So all those things uh, we try to just learn. It's like a data scientist work. We try to collect as much data. Hopefully we refine it, refine it and do better. And I believe we have been getting better each time. Now we have done more than 140 investments over 65-ish companies. And we count as an investment because we look at each decision as a standalone uh, decision. Uh, and we try to do a data scientific approach on that, but like we're constantly learning and it's never easy. So just wanted to, to share that. Fantastic. Well, listen, um, it's been, uh... It's been an interesting first half of the year. It's great to uh, see you both, Shane. I look forward to meeting you in person, finally, eventually. Uh, some of you missed each other in Dubai, but uh, I think great to see you again. Uh, and look, uh, more importantly, uh, wishing you uh, best of luck in the, in the time ahead. Thank you again to Ali and, and the Park Launch team for, for putting this together. I know this is uh, supremely useful for founders. I hope you guys have uh, I found it useful and thank you for, for making the time, uh, both Shane and, and Adi for, for making this happen. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, collaborating. I'm still looking for uh, the deal that we are able to do together. Um, and so I'm looking forward to hopefully that happens this year. Um, so continue to be optimistic. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Atif. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, guys. Right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.